Well, we are uh, entering into a new season for our sermons. We have uh, just finished a series on the table, and uh, we, we hope that uh, the table continues to be important to you as an opportunity uh, to consider, to think, to reflect on the presence of God and those, with those around you. Uh, but we, we are making our way towards some, some special occasions. So we've got Advent coming up at the end of the month. Um, and for us, we have a special treat with Advent's arrival. As we, we wait for Advent, which is about kind of the return of Christ, but also about the first coming of Christ and, and the, the child that was born, uh, we get to also enter into the season being excited because we are going to launch Advent with baptisms, which will be a beautiful day. And so as we get our, on our way towards that, uh, we're going to walk with the lectionary, kind of some recommended readings for churches, um, and these readings are going to be about who Christ is, and as we consider what is it that we give our lives to, what is it that we enter into a community as a, as a church and be baptized into this life together, and so we're going to be reading through texts that are about um, who Christ is uh, and who it is that we profess uh, as Lord of our lives. So today we're going to start by reading from the letter to the Hebrews, and we're going to be in chapter 9. So we're in Hebrews 9, and we're going to pick it up in verse 24 to the end of the chapter. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again, as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The word of the Lord. When I was reading through this text, I was struck by several things, but but so much of it is about presence, about Christ having come and and where he's going and when he comes back and and what Christ's presence brings along the way. And it, it talked a lot about kind of sanctuary, whether that's sanctuary in heaven or, or on earth. And, and I was thinking about, for the ancient context, about people trying to look for God, trying to come into God's presence. And for, for most everyday people, you do not get to go into the presence of God. And for many, they probably were scared to death about being in the presence of any God. Uh, you don't know that God, you know, in the pagan world, that the gods are going to help you, that you, they might get in your way, they might harm you, they might mess things up. And so... Uh, but, but they're seen as too important. They've got other things to do. Why would they visit you? Uh, but for the Hebrew people, that the conception of God was very different. And so they, they have a lot of stories in our Old Testament about meeting God in unexpected places uh, and many images about how God goes in front of them. And so maybe you think about Moses and that fiery bush, that thing just on the horizon that maybe catches your eye and is worth going and exploring and finding God there. Or maybe it's that God who who brings you out of Egypt and you've got the the pillar of cloud by day or the fire by night, the thing that guides you in the wilderness of life. And eventually they're trying to figure out how do I honor and celebrate God's presence in our midst? And and so they develop the tabernacle of God's kind of moving presence among them that well, God's not going to stay in one spot. God's on the move, and we're going to move with God. And so God's seated on the, the, on the, kind of the seat, on the Ark of the Covenant, and, and God travels with us. And eventually, as they settle down into Israel, they start thinking, well, we've settled down. God should have a really nice house. And so David has this idea, we should build a temple for God, and then Solomon's the one who gets to build it. And so they design this this place where the outside nations, they could enter into it so far. The women in the story could enter into it so far. The men can enter into it so far. Then the priests, and then you get to the Holy of Holies, and, and, and you rarely get to go in there, but at some point, chief priests get to go in there. 
And it's this kind of concentric circles of how close do you get to get to God. And so it's not something everybody experienced of getting to go to the Holy of Holies. That was, you know, off limits. And even if you did go in there, you know, it's scary. What, what might God do? It, it's, it's, an un, it's unsafe if you were unclean. You need to be clean when you enter into God's presence. And so into that world, we, we have the story of Jesus coming. And, and Jesus kind of shattering some expectations. And we see Jesus saying, hey, you know, God is, is here now. God's kingdom is near. And he goes before me. And, and we start thinking about God in all sorts of places. And I think about for us, we're not altogether different um, from the ancient world and the ancient people. We think of certain places as being special, right? You, you, if you had a meaningful spiritual experience, that place means something to you. That might have been on a retreat. That might have been on a vacation. That might be a specific spot, a specific pew, a specific place in a church. Um, but there's moments where like God felt present here. This is where God is. And so um, one of the things that we're excited about for the baptisms and, and such that we've got coming up is uh, if you'd like to come help us decorate on November 20th, we're going to be decorating our sanctuary for the Advent season. And uh, it's always a joyous occasion. And if you'd love to come help us, we'd love to help prep the space that maybe God is, is experienced for somebody in that season. Um, and we're here in the, in the chapel today in the Pope's Hall. And you know, like, maybe this is a place where someone has experienced a moment, just a little glimpse of God in our midst. One of the things that I love right now is that weekly, we can also extend that into a different place, that God shows up around a bunch of dinner tables, God shows up in a kitchen, that those are sacred places too, that God is, God's presence is in a lot of places. It's not just kept secret in one particular spot. And so in the story, it feels almost dismissive um, when it says that Christ, he didn't enter into a sanctuary made by human hands. It wasn't manufactured. No person put the place together. And we think about like when it comes to like food and we talk about, oh, is it organic or is there any kind of uh, modified foods? And you know, we, we kind of get that idea of like, man, it seems pristine. It seems clean. It seems healthy. It seems great if it hasn't been touched by us. But Christ didn't just enter into a sanctuary that we built, just our own things, but into heaven itself. And there's this, this picture of some reality that's beyond just what we see and what we hear, what we touch, what we taste that's right now. And I don't think it's meant to be dismissive that all of these sanctuaries made by human hands are bad, but there's a reality beyond it. There's something that we have to see beyond what we see in front of us, that, the, that heaven is a place, uh, is an experience, is a reality that sometimes merges and, 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 and comes together with us. Uh, but it's not that just that Jesus came into this world to live and to walk around a temple in Jerusalem, but Christ goes before God in heaven itself. And he enters into heaven for a reason, for a purpose. He, he didn't go into heaven and go before God to do some things that maybe we might do. Maybe you had a bad week, a bad day, and you're like, I need to vent about somebody. I need to, I need to vent about this experience. Can you believe this person, that person? And I, I imagine Christ had plenty of reason to want to vent about humanity. God, God's, you know, God's the Father's talking to Christ, and tell me, tell me about the people. Tell me this experience, and and there's all this reason to say they mocked me, they hated me, they shamed me, they belittled me, they ignored me. But instead of belittling us. The story says that Christ shows up in God's presence in heaven itself on our behalf. On our behalf. And I wonder how often we resemble Christ on that measure. Like how often do we go about on people's behalf, speaking positively, speaking for somebody else, 
instead of cutting them down, making them small, maybe to make us feel tall, of how do we speak on others' behalves? Because that's how Christ operated in the world. That's how Christ continues to operate even in heaven, is to speak on others' behalf. And it, it can be hard when you've had that bad day, when you've had that bad experience, that you want to speak ill of somebody. It can be hard to, to take a vantage point of love, of hope, of joy, of patience. And so I think about how, how Christ inspires us. That may be a first step for us. If we're trying to figure out how do I enter into someone's presence and be on their behalf and not belittle them, Maybe it's just imagining prayer as that time of going into the sanctuary with God and saying, God, i gotta, I got to practice being on behalf of somebody today. Because I'm having a hard time. Uh, I'm having a hard time with this person. I'm having a hard time loving them right now. So I'm just going to show up into your presence and try to speak on their behalf. And it might not be easy for me, but God, please help me. Help me speak on their behalf. And something about trying to go into the presence of God and speaking for others and not just for ourselves does reshape us. And clearly it's possible because Christ goes before us, speaking on our behalf. He shows us what love is. He shows us what hope is. And so we're just trying to follow suit. How do I walk through this world and into heaven itself on others' behalf? Not tearing them down, but building them up. And so we hear a little bit of how Christ is on our behalf. Not just, it's not all encompassed, but there's a specific moment that it's going to stress in this text. Um, it, what I like is this text has this hypothetical. It says, hey, Christ didn't come this way. Um, here's how Christ comes. And so it, pick, points a, it paints a picture of two kinds of sacrifices, of two kinds of moments. If you imagine the temple, imagine the sanctuary, for the average person in Jerusalem. What you're imagining is the highest priest on the Day of Atonement. They're going to go make some animal sacrifices. They're going to go into the temple, into the sanctuary, into the Holy of Holies, where it's something like heaven. And we don't get to experience ourselves, but they're going to experience it for us. And how is that going to go? We're going to tie a rope around them and hope that they make it alive back out of the Holy of Holies. We're not quite sure how this is going to go. But in this picture, the high priest has to make a an offering. Well, as you get older, maybe you realize, well, every single year we make this offering, and it's the cycle that never ends, that we, we offer up our confession, we offer these animals, and at the end of the, this kind of liturgical year, you have the sacrifice, God's forgiven you. Um, sometimes there, there's the thing about the goat that goes off to the wilderness and all sorts of things, but it's a repetition, it's a cycle. Uh, when, when I mentioned earlier the lectionary, the lectionary is a kind of scripture reading cycle. Uh, it's something that you do over and over. And the writer here in Hebrews wants to be very intentional about what Christ's sacrifice was. If you see it like this Day of Atonement thing, of like that forgiveness, that Christ doesn't need to keep getting up and down off of the cross, that it's a one-time moment, a one-time moment sacrifice, uh, that we don't need to keep putting Jesus back up on the cross to have some sort of new, new renewed kind of experience of forgiveness. Um, and so if you've been used to this repetition and cycle, you're like, okay, well, that was great. That happened then. But what about all the sins I've had this year? What about the next ones? What about the next ones? Are those forgiven? And the writer of Hebrews is like, hey, one time, one sacrifice. And part of what makes that sacrifice different is it wasn't the sacrifice of something else, but the sacrifice of yourself. That Jesus sacrifices his own self, not something else, and he brings that to the altar. Now, I know some people that in practice feel like we want to keep putting Jesus back on the cross, like where it's become like, I don't know, the we just like long to see this painful moment or something like that. Like, let's just keep reliving it. Let's just keep rethinking about that painful moment. And it's a little weird of like the fixation of only wanting to stay in that time. Like, if you want to keep going back to Easter Sunday and like tombs being empty, that's a more pleasant moment to kind of want to keep revisiting for yourself. But I think for some of us, we have a hard time letting go of our sins, letting go of our problems, of our mistakes. 
And so we live in this constant gripping where you feel like you're ashamed of yourself. You feel like God's ashamed of you. You feel like you're not amounting to anything, that you're not good enough. And so we just want to keep Jesus on the cross forever. Just as long as he stays up there, because I've just been so bad, I, I just, I'm not worth anything, uh, I need forgiveness. And we live where we just want to keep Jesus in a perpetual sacrifice. As opposed to, in this story, where it says, hey, he dealt with it. <laughs> he dealt with the sin. He doesn't have to go back. It's not a, a repetition. Because um, it says here, I'll just read it again. He wasn't there to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters into the holy place and does year after year with blood that's not his own. For then he would have to suffer again and again, even since the foundation of the world, it would just have to keep happening. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice himself. And, uh, and later, not to deal with sin, because he's already dealt with it. And so we have this image of Jesus having one time sacrificed himself, and that that ends the age. Time is different. The, the new age begins in which the world is never going to be the same. And so we don't have to do a cyclical pattern about time. It's just, no, that chapter is over. Start a new year. Don't go back. Live into the new era. And so in this era, it doesn't need continual sacrifice. It doesn't need that. And depending on when this is written, there's different kind of relevancy to early Christians. Because in the book of Acts, we see early Christians at the temple complex. And you imagine if they're at the temple complex, maybe they take part in some offerings. There's even a story about Paul, and he, he's trying to reconcile with some people. And like, here, you know what, we went ahead and made an offering about this thing. And so for early Christians, they're wondering, do I still take part in sacrifices? Is, like, what's different? And this is a text that's into this conversation that's saying that moment ended that era. The world is different. You can go forward not fretting about it anymore. Don't be anxious about this. Live into this new experience. And so I, I want to invite folks that like, if, you, if you can't get past some mistake that you've made, if you can't get past some harm that you've caused, obviously confess, ask for forgiveness, see how you can reconcile with someone. But don't just live in a perpetual cycle where you just can't forgive yourself. You, can't, you don't feel like God loves you. You can move forward with God uh, and not just be stuck into the cycle of, of shame and guilt and disappointment. And so this sacrifice isn't like any other sacrifice. It's a one-time thing has lasting effect, it changes time, it changes things going forward. It's about sacrificing not something else, like the scapegoating of something else, it's, it's Christ sacrificing himself. And so it's time to, to move past that, to look forward, to look beyond just that moment. And again, because it wasn't just about that moment, it's about starting a new age, a new time, a new existence. And so, in this story, we then ask, well, well, what's next? What comes later? What comes after it? If you're, you know, I love movies, you make a good movie, people are like, okay, when are you making the sequel? Because that's just how the movie industry works. Uh, and so Jesus comes, it, it reshapes people's lives. They're like, hey, this is a one-time sacrifice. Well, now what? What's this new age like? What, what's coming next? And so the writer here of Hebrews kind of keeps this high priest imagery. All right, so we, I mentioned earlier, you tie a rope around the high priest in case he dies while he's in the Holy of Holies. Like, that's some real, like, fear of God. And, you know, at some point, you figure you don't do a practice unless you needed it. Right? Like, who, who, who would have thought about, I should tie a rope around this person? Um, I don't know... Um, <laughs> Maybe, maybe, I'm trying to think of what would be even somewhat of a comparison. Um, maybe when, uh, when we did that Christmas Silent Night video, and we tried to get some pictures of inside the steeple. Maybe Ron and I, when we went up to go get some steeple things, you might want to have tied a rope around us to get us out of that weird uh, part of the building that's hard to get into. 
Um, but like, there's some danger involved if you're going to tie a rope around somebody. Uh, and so you don't know, is this person coming back? And that's hard to really imagine. But you get into that world and you imagine the high priest made the sacrifice, we're going into a space that we feel like is dangerous. Are they going to come back out? And at some point, the high priest comes back out, says a word of blessing. You're like, ah, it's a new, new time. Time to move on and go about my day. And maybe there's a meal or something else you've got going on. But, but you're waiting for the high priest's return. And so it, it's kind of in that vein, thinking about likewise, Christ was exalted. He sacrificed himself. Uh, and we celebrate that he went into the presence of God and he spoke on our behalf. He dealt with sin. But we really hope he comes back. We want to see him back. He's coming back, right? And so what are we doing in the midst of this waiting in this time period? And so I love that in this text it says, and, and just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, it's, it quotes a proverb. It's basically like quoting like an everyday saying where everybody would agree. And it says, hey, you know how people die and then they get judged? You know, yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, so it's like meet your maker or whatever kind of our own ways of saying that. Well, you die, you're going to get judged. That's the story. Well, it's not quite the story for the writer of Hebrews. He's like, no, like, you, you die, but Christ has already made forgiveness. So, like, that judgment that you're fearing isn't exactly what you are expecting to, to see here. And so Christ has come so that you won't have that kind of experience that we all assume is the case. And so when Christ comes back, he doesn't have to deal with sin. He already dealt with it. And I feel like we still live in the cycle where we feel like Christ like, still has to deal with sin. And this author is so very much in a different space. Hey, it's 2,000 years ago. One time thing, Christ dealt with it. Now it's time for something else. Stop thinking about it. Stop, move past it. Live beyond the, the kind of enslavement to that moment. And so for so many people, it, you know, when we kind of simplify our faith into like really easy catchphrases and stuff, we simplify it into tracks and we simplify it into these like little like, um, I need you to know that you're an awful sinner uh, and unless you pray with me and say these exact words and ask for forgiveness about it right now, like unless you do that with me, you're not actually saved. As if like forgiveness still hangs by a string and is, and is waiting on your, your response. But I think our scripture writers are often much more um, kind of outrageous to us in their faith and, and how they understood the cross. Like, hey, sin was dealt with. Christ sacrificed himself. It's gone. It's done. It's past. When you think about the writer um, from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Like the kind of forgiveness that's going on in, this, in these, these recountings of what's happening in the life of Jesus startle us because we still want our own justice system. Like here's what you need to, com- to, uh, to get this forgiveness. Like here's, here's the methodology. Um, and you're still not sure whether God's on the right side with you or not, but... But here's Jesus saying, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The writer of Hebrews saying, hey, sin, he doesn't have to come back and deal with it. He already dealt with it. So what does Christ have to come back to do? It's not to deal with sin. And so many people feel like that's still the thing that Christ has to come to do something about. Like, hey, I dealt with it. What Christ comes back to do is to save, to deliver, to liberate because we know that the lingering effects of the previous era still hold their grasp on us. That we still feel imprisoned to greed and the way that greed then causes harm and pain on ourselves and the people that we, we interact with. We know that we still feel enslaved at times to, uh, to jealousy, to lust, to impatience, to hatefulness. And it's not hard to look around the world and still see the lingering effects of where those things still have a grip on people. 
And so Christ is not coming back to suddenly kind of settle accounts of right and wrong, of, of sin and goodness in that sense. Christ is coming back to reign and set free, to liberate from bondage, from slavery, so that we might fully live into a new reality, one that was inaugurated almost 2,000 years ago. And so what kind of waiting is it? It's not the waiting of like, hey, when you die, you're going to meet your judgment, and I hope I'm in the right spot, and I'm afraid, and is God on my side or not? You're, you're waiting eagerly because you're hopeful. Christ is coming to save, to deliver, to liberate which is not the same feeling as Christ is knocking at the door ready to punish you. Oh no, did I answer right or not? Of God is coming to set, Christ is coming to set you free. And so when I read through this text, it gives me a lot of hope um, because it is a picture of Jesus that, that does take away chains, that takes away uh, things that hold us down. You know, there are so many people who, who do, they just can't get at past whatever things they've done wrong. And, and it's hard to get past those things. That's why we need liberation. Like, our body remembers things. So there are things that just, you can't help but go back to moments of pain in your past. And we need some sort of deliverance from that. We need some sort of freeing but it's not that Christ is counting. Oh, here's all the mistakes you've made. Oh, well, here's some good things. Keeping a tab on you. Christ wants you to be free. Wants you to live. Wants you to have life. And his return is not something to fret, but something to rejoice about. Something to celebrate. Something to be excited for. And so... When I think about the, the path to uh, baptism, when I think about what it is to be the church, like what is it that your tone, your spirit, is one of eagerness? Like does that tone, does that characterize the church? Are we eager? Because it's easy to be pessimistic, it's easy to be ashamed, it's easy to feel guilty, it's easy to feel all sorts of things. But I was really struck by that, that phrase of people waiting eagerly for Christ's return so that people might be liberated, delivered, set free. And so when I think about, well, in the meantime, how do you eagerly wait for Jesus for that liberation, that deliverance? And it looks like manufacturing, making some places that look like heaven. You know, we, we do our best to build up some places that give people the experience of heaven on earth. Uh, one of my friends who's, who's came and preached with us on a couple occasions, usually when, it's, when I'm sick, um, but Jamin, I love his uh, church community, their like, motto is in Jackson as in heaven. And I like that phrasing. Um, but how do we give people the experience of heaven now? The experience where Christ's freedom and liberation is felt. And I hope that our worship services give that feeling, that, that you are free, that you are uh, liberated, and I'm so grateful, so excited for the last three weeks as we've gotten to launch with Cafe Connection that we have a space where people can walk in and experience hopefully a little bit of heaven on earth, a little bit of something that's not the ordinary, not the everyday, something that gets your vision past wherever, whatever you're seeing into something new. And there's just such beauty in giving people that moment. And so I hope we feel encouraged and we feel eager help create that kind of space where people feel free, that no matter what your past held, there's new opportunities, there's new life. We're not, we're not going to just keep counting all the problems, all the wrongs. We're going we're gonna to just live. Uh, and when you think about um, for on Wednesday nights when our meals are, are free, uh, what I think what startles us sometimes is that when you offer something free, people want to contribute to it, and they want to support it. And so people are generous because they love and they see an experience of some sort of heaven. So they want to contribute to it. Um, but people's service and their experience is not tied to a, a backtracking of 
of checking account, how well did you manage or did not manage expenses, or how well did you manage or didn't manage your opportunities, that no matter your past, you walk in and you have the opportunity to experience heaven itself amongst us. And so that's the kind of community that we, we hope to be, that we manufacture, that we give some, some built, designed opportunities for people to experience heaven. And, and not guilt, not shame, not the way that the world works. And so that's the kind of community that, that I long to, to live out, to be a part of. I hope it's the kind of community that, that people want to get baptized into. They would say, I want to be a part of this. And it is a part of that eager waiting for Christ's return to save us all. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I ask that you'd be with our our hearts and our spirits today, that you might give us a renewed eagerness for what might be, for how heaven might be experienced more fully on earth, that your kingdom might come and your will might be done here. Lord, I ask that you would give us hands and feet that we might help build up reflections, copies, things that, that show people who you are and how you are in this world. Lord, for whoever is feeling that shame, that guilt, whatever thing that holds them down, we ask that your forgiveness might be fully experienced, understood, realized, so that that person that each of us might live freely into a new day, a new era. Let us not live looking backward, afraid of our past, but look forward with eagerness and hope about where you are building our lives and ourselves into. Lord, renew us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.